Hello, and thank you for joining us today. This is the Institute for Research on Poverty's webinar series, and I'm your host, Steve Cook. Today's presenter is Kristen Seefeld. She's Assistant Professor of Social Work and Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Kristen has a new book, Abandoned Families, Social Isolation in the 21st Century, that was released in December by Russell Sage Press, and we're very happy to have her come and give us some of her findings. In this volume, she examines the economic and residential segregation facing many low-income workers, particularly African Americans, and how those factors limit their families' chances for upward mobility. Uh, we're very glad that she is with us today. In addition to thanking our presenter for sharing her research, uh, we'd also like to thank the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their support of this webinar series. We would like to encourage the audience to participate in today's presentation. You'll notice the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. You can submit questions anytime throughout the presentation, and we've reserved time at the end of the webinar for our presenter to respond. Uh, now we'll turn it over to Kristen. Well, and I'll continue with the, with the thanks. Um, I really want to just thank all the folks at IRP for providing me with this opportunity to, to talk about my book and for, to everybody who, who's joined in on the webinar. Um, I also do want to acknowledge uh, the various funders who really made this work possible, and that includes the National Poverty Center at the University of Michigan, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, but of course any views that I express. Um, are my own. <laughs> so before I get started, I just wanted to make um, a few preliminary remarks about what I'll be presenting here. So first, um, most of the people who participated you know, in the study on, on which the book is based um, and who I'll be talking about today are low-income African-American women. And that is an identity that I don't share. Um, and I do recognize that there are really some inherent challenges and potential problems related to power differences in, in doing this kind of work. It's my hope that through careful analysis and continual reflection that I've grappled with some of these differences, but I don't want to claim that I fully have, have overcome them. Um, but I do think it's really important and I fundamentally believe that race and our ongo ongoing challenges of dealing with and, and coming to terms with racial injustice in this country really plays a key role um, in the story that I'll be telling. Um, second, I want to just define a few terms. Um, so first is, is social isolation, which is in the title of, of my book as well. So I'm using the term social isolation to, as a phenomenon that occurs when marginalized groups have limited country, uh, contact with so-called mainstream America. So this is uh, the definition used by William Julius Wilson in his book, The Truly Disadvantaged. And you know, he defines mainstream America as you know, employed individual, individuals, community organizations, and the institutions associated with um, the working and middle classes. Um, so social isolation is used in telling a, a story about structural disadvantage and you know, behavior is, is shaped by lack of access to structures of, of opportunity and, and mobility. And this concept of social isolation has really shaped a lot of the research and even the, some of the social policy related to poverty and anti-poverty alleviation um, since Wilson's book came out in the late 80s. Um, Ultimately, my argument, though, is that social isolation alone doesn't really fully capture uh, the experiences of those who are seeking opportunity and upward mobility. Um, I'm arguing that there's been a series of economic policy and political changes that have really altered those structures of opportunity. We've had uh, changed labor markets, post-secondary education and housing markets that just don't offer, offer the same opportunities for advancement and for wealth building. Um, social protections um, that were once in place have been really stripped away, leaving families exposed to fairly great financial risk. And not only are families unable to move up economically, but they're often left in debt from both the investments they make in their future and their own uh, struggle to make ends meet. So I describe this experience as social abandonment. Um, it's a new form of separate and, and unequal. 
separate and separate segregated labor and housing markets, post-secondary education institutions, and financial products uh, really do shape the lives of the families that I met. And further, debt really functions as a modern-day form of sharecropping. And I'm using these terms such as separate and unequal and segregated and sharecropping very deliberately um, because, as I will argue, this phenomenon of social abandonment is just the latest in a set of policy choices and institutional changes that really serve to perpetuate racial inequality. Now, that's not to say that some poor and lower income whites have you know, have not been affected by social abandonment, but really fundamentally uh, social abandonment is tied to past and ongoing discrimination, as well as to racial residential segregation and predatory practices in lending that are deployed so much more frequently against people of color. So social abandonment is really then a concept, I think, that can help us understand the maintenance and growth of both income and, and wealth inequality between uh, blacks and whites. So now that I've sort of laid out my, my basic argument, you know, let me back up quite a bit and you know, talk about how did I, how did I get here. Um, so originally, back in 2006, what I thought I w was interested in, in studying was understanding how economically vulnerable families you know, were faring, faring during the first really significant economic downturn since a number of you know, major social policy um, changes were implemented. You know, Michigan had the you know, luck of entering into a recession before the rest of the country, and I thought it would be a good time to look at how you know, how a, a downturn affected uh, low-income families you know, since passage of welfare reform and since um, expansion of the earned income tax credit, um, you know, policies with bo which both you know, mandated and, and rewarded work, respectively. But once I got into the field, um, it became clear pretty quickly that welfare reform, that the EITC, and that even the recession itself was a very small part of a, of a much larger study. So I collected uh, interview data, in-depth interview data, um, over a six-year period with the same uh, women, um, analyzed that data, and then placed my findings you know, sort of in the context of larger social trends and, you know, and other studies, and thus you know, was able to, uh, to draw my conclusions. So very briefly, I'm not going to go into great detail ab about, you know, the sample, um, although certainly I can talk more in, in Q&A about that. Um, but I, uh, again, I interviewed 45 women, um, the same 45 women each year from 2006 all the way through 2011. Most of these women lived in south, south, southeast Michigan. They primarily lived in Detroit. I was able to follow people as they moved, sometimes out of state. Most of them were African American. Most, but not all, were single mothers, at least at some point during that six-year period. And I refer to most of these women as strivers. Um, they're actively engaged in activities and attempts to move out of poverty and into the middle class, or for some of them to maintain the precarious middle class status that they had attained. There is a smaller group of women who, in the book, I call you know, the truly abandoned. Um, they're very poor, very marginalized. Um, again, I had not planned to spend much time talking about them uh, in this particular presentation, but certainly I can uh, answer any questions during Q&A. Um, you know, because this is a, a research study based um, in Detroit, uh, one of the questions I often get is, you know, is, is the story I'm telling about social abandonment really a story about families in Detroit? And I'm going to say no. Um, you know, the data that we have on home ownership, on college enrollment trends, on student loan debt, predatory lending, you know, and, and other various trends really lean, lean, lend credence to the argument that what we're seeing is, is a national phenomenon, and that's helping to reproduce and maintain racial inequalities. So the, spirit, the experiences of women in this study, you know, even though they are residents of the Detroit area, really illustrate processes through which social abandonment occurs. So next, I want to kind of turn to the very, you know, these, these processes. How does social abandonment um, play out? 
And the first avenue that I want to uh, look at is um, employment and, uh, and the ways in which employers uh, have abandoned families uh, in the promise of inclusion that in employment uh, should provide. To work, you know, as we know, is very important for, um, for a number of reasons. You know, for most of us, it is the primary source of our income. And for many of us, it's also the major organizer of our time. Within the literature on poverty, um, unemployment is thought to contribute to a number of, of various problems, including social isolation. Um, and we sort of view work as an integrating mechanism, a, a way for people to feel part of a, a larger society. Now, I'm sure most people know there's been a lot of work done on all of the various negative aspects of the low-wage labor market, you know, including unstable hours and schedules for workers, low pay, lack of benefits, and certainly the jobs in which most of the women in this study worked, you know, have all of those characteristics. Um, so what I want to talk about, though, is some other um, issues and some other factors associated with, with these jobs um, you know, that, that don't get highlighted quite as much. So to do that, I want to introduce you to, um, to Shanice. So Shanice was just 19 years old when we first started interviewing her. Um, at that time, she was looking for a job, but she'd already worked quite a bit. Um, she'd had various jobs in light manufacturing, some others in retail, but they were all temporary positions, so none of them lasted very long. Now, Shanice had drop, dropped out of high school in the 12th grade. Um, she didn't like the alternative school she'd been sent to when she became pregnant, and she really did think that the lack of a high school degree was holding her back from getting a job. But the next year when we talked to her, she was really excited to report that she had completed training to become a certified nurse, a, a CNA, certified nurse assistant. Um, and she just passed the state certification exam. Um, she hadn't found a job, but you know, her certification was brand new and she felt really confident. But then the next year when we came back, um, you know, Shanice was employed, but she wasn't employed as a CNA. Um, she worked for an agency you know, that sent her out to people's homes and to do as she described it, you know, bathe them, dress them, clean them up for them, help them with their prescriptions, and so forth. And while Shanice had certainly received training in all of these areas, although not in cooking meals, um, she was really essentially functioning as a home health care Aid, you know, one of the fastest growing occupations, but one that is, you know, a very low level healthcare job. Furthermore, Shanice had almost no supervision on her job. You know, when I asked her how much supervision she, re she, she received, she said to me, quote, I'm basically on my own. As for coworkers, she said to me, I pretty much don't even see my coworkers. Shanice, in fact, faxed in her timesheets. Uh, she received her work assignments over the phone. She almost never went into the agency's office, um, and she rarely ever saw her supervisor in person. Shanice really worked alone. Well, why would we think working alone would matter? Um, I think for a couple of different reasons. Many of these workers were really invisible to their employers. And if you're invisible to your employer, perhaps that makes, you, makes it easier for you to be fired or otherwise let go. People didn't really have any connections to other people. It was harder, you know, it's harder to learn from others, learn from your coworkers. It's harder to organize um, in terms of labor, labor movements. You know, it's harder to font, form bonds with other people if you never see them. Um, and these bonds might be particularly important, you know, given some other things uh, that happen in the workplace, um, which I'll talk about next. So workplace isolation was certainly um, you know, a phenomenon experienced by all of the people who worked in home health care, and that's a job which many of the women in this study cycled through. But it was also a characteristic of the jobs um, such as janitorial work, um, stocking shelves and big box stores, which usually occurred after hours um, and, uh, when, when staffing was particularly thin, and also um, working from home, uh, doing customer service jobs or uh, virtual office uh, assistance, which was another job uh, that women held. The other aspect of um, 
low-wage uh, work that I want to talk about is workplace violations. So to do this, I'll introduce you to Geneva. So Geneva, um, we met her when she was trying to return to her job at a telecommunication, telecommunications firm. Um, she had been injured, but she was mostly healed, and that injury occurred when she fell in the company's parking lot. But in order to return back to work, she needed some accommodations. Um, she needed to have her desk move closer to the restroom so that she wouldn't have to walk very far. Um, she needed access to a handicapped parking space in the parking lot. And most importantly for her, she needed a special chair with lumbar support. Um, her desk did get moved, um, and she did get a chair, but only for a short period of time. Um, she told me what happened. Uh, at her workplace, she said, quote, they took my chair because other people started complaining. Oh, she has a special chair, and her chair does this and that. And so they took my chair. And they told me I would have to have, I would have to sit in a regular chair because they were getting too many complaints about this chair. Shortly after having her chair taken away from her, Geneva was fired due to attendance issues. Um, she often had to work, miss work when her pain got very bad. And certainly, although this retelling you know, of, of the firing includes only Geneva's point of view, um, the incident with the chair seems to be a clear violation of, of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, Geneva had a, a doctor's prescription for, for the chair. Um, and you know, under ADA, if she could perform the essential functions of her job with reasonable accommodations, she should have been provided those accommodations. You know, the chair was, was one of those, and, and it might have been conceivable that allowing some flexibility in her schedule could be a reasonable accommodation. Um, Geneva litigated a, a disputed workers' compensation claim, um, but she didn't know that she could have possibly sued for ADA noncompliance. And her employer likely counted on, on that lack of knowledge. Um, you know, unjust firing is something that can be be litigated, but in the low-wage labor market, workers are really unlikely, you know, to go this route. Um, they may lack money to do that. They may lack the time to engage in a potential court case, and they may lack knowledge of of their rights. And for many folks, you know, they had previously endured pretty abusive workplace behavior, and they may just not have known that this sort of recourse was available. Um, and with workplace isolation, with not having a lot of contact with other colleagues, um, or in Geneva's case, you know, colleagues who were very resentful of her, there's really no opportunities to learn about these sorts of uh, options. So next, I want to turn to um, so some of the institutions that we traditionally think of as promoting upward mobility. If, if we think of employment as an institution that promotes inclusion and, and stability in one's life, you know, in our country, education and, and home ownership are supposed to promote upward mobility. So, you know, for generations now, higher education has been seen as a, a pathway to prosperity. Um, you know, there's a so-called wage premium of, of having additional education, and it's substantial. So bachelor's degree old holders you know, earned an additional $430 a week compared to those with, with a high school degree. And over a 40-year career, the typical college graduate earns $650,000 more than someone holding just a high school diploma. Um, Home ownership, you know, has been seen, you know, as sort of the American dream. And even after the Great Recession, um, you know, after the bursting of, of the housing bubble, homes for, for Americans still comprise the, the largest so, source of wealth for the average household. So why are, do these institutions no longer provide sort of the, the promise of, of upward mobility that they, that they once did? Um, so I'll talk about Yvette. So Yvette, um, someone, you know, again, that I met in 2006. Uh, she's a mother of, of five. And she had her first two children, you know, at, at a very young age. Um, and despite that, she st was the holder of, of a bachelor's degree in business management. But it took her a really long time to get that degree. She said, quote, well, it took me about 12 years, one class at a time, but I just stuck with it. Because when I had my oldest child, everybody said my life was over, ruined, you know. 
but I still had that get up and go about me. So for someone like Yvette, a real striver, you know, that get up and go for her translated into working a full-time job, you know, raising her sons, and then of course taking one class at a time to earn her degree. So originally Yvette had enrolled in a community college um, in the state that she was living at at, at the time. Um, she grew up in Michigan and, and returned to the state, and then she started taking some classes at, at a local university. However, she obtained her degree from you know, the University of Phoenix, a, a largely online for-profit degree granting institution. And while the cost of attending community college and even the cost of, it, of attending the local university was low enough you know, for Yvette to be able to afford that out of pocket and also with um, you know, Pell Grants and, and other forms of aid, when she started taking classes at the University of Phoenix, she started taking out loans to pay the tuition. And by the time she finished, she had a total of $30,000 in student loans. Now, the student loan debt crisis is something we hear about a lot. And for those of us who are at institutions of higher ed, you know, we know that many of our students carry, you know, carry that debt. But there's supposed to be a payoff to it. But 10 years after finishing that degree, you know, she proclaimed it to be worthless. She said, quote, I'm paying $30,000 on this student loan for something that's giving me a job one step above McDonald's. That job was as a customer services rep for a, a cable company. Um, it was a very isolating job in which she sat at a computer and was attached to a headset all day. And you know, in a good year, she earned about $45,000 a year, despite having a bachelor's degree and despite having years of work experience. So the women that I talked to you know, were really relegated to an entirely different segment of the educational market. They attended for-profit institutions, community colleges, and sometimes they took most or all of their uh, classes online. It makes their experience really different, markedly different, you know, compared to students who get to attend a four-year institution, attend it full-time, live on campus, and take classes in a physical classroom with other students and an instructor who is there in person. For these women, um, their experience in, in higher education was really a, you know, a lonely and isolated enterprise, you know, separate and really unequal from the traditional system of higher education that we often think of. Additionally, some women really lacked examples in their own networks you know, of people who had gone to school. So they really sometimes did not understand the implications of, of going part-time, just how long it, it would take and how much debt they could accrue or of choosing or changing majors, which dragged out the process of obtaining a degree even longer. They were really, though, left largely on their own to navigate the process of choosing classes and monitoring uh, progress toward their degree. Um, you know, women who attended community college didn't have the same levels of, of debt as those who attended for-profit institutions, but many of the community colleges in the area were you know, overburdened, and advisors and counselors you know, often didn't have time to see, to see students. In the end, six years later, of the 21 women who were enrolled in some form of post-secondary education, only eight of them ever finished. Yvette was also a homeowner, um, and she was a homeowner who, who lost her ho house to foreclosure. And while predatory lending and the fallout of the housing crisis is something that's been well covered um, by the news, there are other um, aspects of, of home ownership um, that resulted uh, in a lot of uh, damage for, for people in, in my study who, who tried to buy homes and have some source of wealth. Um, the neighborhoods in which they lived um, were neighborhoods that continued to decline, um, and owning a home could mean being stuck in such a neighborhood. No one was going to you know, sell your, uh, buy your house if you put it for sale. 
Also, a lot of these neighborhoods uh, were ones where there were high levels of, of arson and other property damage. I was struck by the number of women who had experience with uh, fires being set either to their home or to a, a next door neighbor's home. And other sorts of property damage, like stripping of metals and, and electrical wiring, even in houses that were occupied. And then for people, you know, both homeowners who moved and also people who, who were renters or moved, moving meant losing so much, um, in particular loss of one's own possessions. People didn't have money to, to rent moving vans. Um, they often didn't have friends who could uh, help them out and, and move large items. So what that ended up meaning was that possessions got left behind and people had to start all over again if they moved in, into a different house. You know, and sometimes those moves were not, not by choice. Finally, I want to talk about the abandonment that occurred um, with the safety net. And to do this, I'll um, use the, the situation of, of Rhonda, who was a single mother of four. She uh, was also a home health care worker, but she lost that job in February of 2010. Um, she had been receiving food stamps um, because her income is, you know, from her, her job was so low. Um, and once she lost her job, her benefits should have increased to account for the loss of her earnings. So that was in February. But in March, instead of her benefits going up, the food stamps actually stopped altogether. Now, Rhonda was someone who has always had a very even-keeled effect. She didn't really ever show anger, or she didn't really even show much emotion um, when we were doing the interviews. Um, but in retelling this story, um, her voice, um, the, the volume of her voice increased quite a bit, and she became you know, more animated than, than I'd ever seen her. You know, she said that the case wor her caseworker had promised to, you know, to correct what was a mistake. Her benefits shouldn't have been stopped. Um, and indeed, Rhonda did end up later receiving uh, her benefits later in the month of, of March. But then in April, her benefits stopped again. She called her caseworker repeatedly, but her caseworker never returned any of her calls. R Rhonda eventually got in touch with a supervisor in the welfare office, and her food stamp benefits returned in May, but then they stopped again in June. In July, she was receiving them again. Uh, when she was able to get in, in touch with her caseworker, her caseworker said that the problem was caused by you know, a glitch in the state's computer system, and she couldn't figure out how to fix it. Um, through all of this, you know, the onus of monitoring her food stamp case was placed entirely on Rhonda. And Rhonda reported that when her caseworker, instead of ever apologizing for what was happen, happening to her, really took Rhonda to task for not letting the situation drop and for, not, uh, and for calling her, her supervisor uh, and, and reporting uh, the, uh, the unreturned uh, phone calls. So we know that you know, when people lose jobs, you know, we have a number of, of safety net programs in place that are, are supposed to help buffer people against any hardships that they might face during unemployment. But the families that I interviewed really couldn't count on these benefits. Um, and it wasn't you know, a benefit like TANF, which is a program that, of course, has received a lot of attention recently for some of its, its shortcomings. Um, and I would draw your attention to the book $2 a, a Day by my colleague Luke Schaefer and, and Kathy Eden. But it was other benefits, too, um, benefits like food stamps, like Medicaid, that would start and stop again for no apparent reason, that would take a year in some cases for someone to finally be determined eligible for when paperwork would get repeatedly lost or when workers wouldn't return calls. So obtaining benefits often meant for people that they had to fight with lawyers, they had to fight with employers, and they had to fight with bureaucrats. Um, for women who, who were receiving unemployment insurance, in all but one case, getting that benefit meant having to um, protest a, a contestation that, that an employer had made. You know, 
several women were laid off by their employers, but then when they tried to receive UI benefits, found out that their, their employer had contested the filing um, and said that they were actually fired. Um, and it, in several cases, you know, took half a year for this situation to be resolved. So the abandonment that occurred um, when people could not access safety net benefits in, in a timely manner really led to debt. People used credit cards to pay for their basic expenses. Some people stopped paying on one bill to pay another and continually got behind in, in uh, accruing debt. You know, and then you know, people also had debt because they were trying to um, be upwardly mobile. They had student loans. They had mortgages. And you know, high interest rates on, on many of those loans, you know, coupled with uneven income, really made it hard for people to pay down debt. So this cycle you know, that families experience, you know, not making enough money in the first place, then losing jobs, then not being able to quickly access the safety net, and then going on into debt you know, in addition to the significant debt that they already had to finance upper mobility, really, in my mind, has very eerie parallels to the sharecropper system that was in place you know, in po the post-Civil War South. You know, so sharecropping kept a stable supply of, of labor on, on plantations after slavery ended. You know, and sharecroppers formed plots of lands owned by someone else in return for a share of the profits of the crops. But in order to raise the crops, you know, the farmer needed to purchase seeds and supplies and other items, and this was often done you know, from, directly from the landowner on credit. But then the high interest rates charged by many landowners for these loans and some of the unscrupulous practices that occurred when it came time to settle up at the end of a harvest often meant that sharecroppers just remained in debt to the landowner and needed to stay on for another season to work off their debt. Meanwhile, the landowner could sell the crop uh, on the market at a higher price you know, than the value credited to the sharecropper, and thus the cycle continues. For the abandoned women you know, who I uh, interviewed, you know, the wages they were paid or the benefits that they could get to replace lost wages you know, were never enough or they never came in a timely enough fashion to keep up with bill payments. So employers you know, controlled when and how much women worked. The social welfare bureaucracy had a great deal of control over the disbursement of benefits. And the credit card companies set the terms you know, for borrowing. And in the end, families were always left in debt. The money coming in was always less than the money going out. In the six years that I followed people, only one person was ever able to pay off all of her debt. Um, and that was someone who was nearly homeless um, and was living on a very small, small amount of food stamps. Um, this is really much like the landowner, you know, who does the hiring, who sets the interest rates charged on loans, and decides the prices you know, at harvest time when trying to settle up. So families today really use debt as a way to manage day to day, you know, like the sharecroppers did when they had to borrow in order to plant and to pay rent and to pur purchase food. You know, Unlike uh, the previous era, families today are often using debt, you know, student loans and mortgages to, fi to finance upward mobility, and that's upward mobility that never gets realized. So in short, debt is really the fallout of social abandonment. It's the fallout of employers not providing true, of employment not providing true inclusion, of education and home ownership not providing upward mobility, and of the safety net failing. This all contributes to the reproduction of existing inequalities in a number of dimensions between the poor and the non-poor and between, importantly, uh, whites and blacks. So there's much more uh, detail in my book. What I've tried to do is just provide um, really a broad overview um, and just a few of, of the stories. Um, but before, um, before I, I end, I want to talk a little bit about the question of, of what could po policy possibly do. You know, so I wrote this book before we had our most recent presidential election. And you know, in the immediate policy environment, um, some of uh, 
the suggestions I'm going to make might seem completely infeasible and in some cases might seem completely unrealistic. Um, that said, I'm going to put them out on the table because I think you know we still need to keep talking about some of the remedies you know that could truly make a, a difference, even if in the short run um, we might not be able to implement them. So I'm just going to highlight three um, right now. So the first is some sort of worker bill of rights. Um, workers really need to be better protected. And there needs to be, in my, in my mind, a shift in the balance of power away from a little bit more away from employers and to employees. In, you know, it's never going to be an equal relationship, but over time, employers you know, have the upper hand much of, much of the time. So this is not an original idea, a, a worker's bill of rights. Um, and in fact, a number of different advocacy organizations who work on behalf of certain occupations, and I'm thinking here restaurant employees and, and domestic workers, you know, have proposed such bills. Um, San Francisco, not that long ago, adopted a bill of such a bill of rights for retail workers. And provisions um, in these bills typically include you know, a guarantee of a minimum number of hours a week so that people have some idea of a minimum amount of what, the, what they're going to bring home, um, have workers having input into uh, their scheduling, and then the right of part-time workers to obtain uh, full-time work if it, if it becomes available. I think also important are the ability to organize and you know, and a push for higher wages. You know, again, something that is happening in some cities around the country, um, but has really only been occurring at a very local level. The second set of, of recommendations I would make would be reforms um, to the safety net. Um, Unemployment insurance, which I, I discussed briefly, I think needs to be easier to access for people who work in the low-wage labor market. You know, we know from other studies that low-wage workers often don't even uh, try to apply for unemployment because they believe they might be ineligible. And some of them may be, but not everybody. Um, we also need to sort of rethink a system in which employers have an incentive uh, to contest the benefit filings of, of their laid off workers. The current funding structure of, of UI uh, means that employers you know, get sort of penalized when their former employees uh, use UI. Um, that has led to um, some employers you know, sort of routinely contesting uh, the filing of benefits in the hopes that people won't, uh, you know, won't pursue it any longer and, and just drop it. Um, so a rethinking of, of the financing of, of UI seems like it should be in line. Um, money for better automated systems. I mean, the, the system glitches that uh, Rhonda described having experienced, you know, these sorts of things seem like you know, they could be easily fixed. You know, the technology is, is available. Um, we just need you know, the will to, to do better. Um, you know, reforming TANF is and other and other sorts of benefit programs, you know, is something that many others have have talked about. You know, it is also the case that for many families in my study, um, you know, TANF was was a benefit that was almost impossible to use, um, and folks often just survived on on food stamps during spells of of unemployment. Um, finally, and probably most controversial, I'm going to bring up the idea of reparations, but reparations in the form of baby bonds. And this is an idea that's being advanced by uh, economists Derek Hamilton and, and Sandy Darity. And these are child savings accounts who, that would be available to children whose parents you know, have lower than median levels of, of wealth. And it would be progressive so that those with lower wealth would receive larger bonds. And these bonds could be cashed in at age 18 and used as a baseline for further wealth building in, in the future. So instead of having to go into so much debt to get a, to get a, a post-secondary degree, um, to go into so much debt when jobs were lost, there would be some amount of savings in, in the banks. 
So just um, finally, uh, to sum up, um, you know, families of all races and ethnicities, you know, have been exposed to, to social abandonment. But it really is a problem that is, you know, particularly found in African American communities. And the very institutions that once promoted opportunity you know, and inclusion you know, have really changed in ways that they've left too many families abandoned, left them lacking in hope, and really lacking in faith that those in power care about their plight. Um, social abandonment, I think, is something we, that can be undone. Um, Geneva, the last time I talked to her, said that she felt like that she and her family were just being thrown away by policymakers. Um, we really need, as a nation, to think about ways to bring abandoned families back into the fold and recognize that no, no family, no person is really someone who should be thrown away. Um, and I will, will stop with that, and I look forward to uh, addressing people's questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, for those in the audience who have questions, a uh, reminder, you can type those questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll have Kristen uh, answer as many as we can get to. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with a question sort of about so the, the interviews, obviously, that you conducted with with the group of, of women that you were talking with uh, have happened, you know, in, in fairly recent times. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if we can, maybe if you could talk a little bit about the way that you've seen um, connection, connection to employment, connection to uh, possibilities for upward mobility and the social and the social safety net have changed over sort of a longer scale of time. So. You know, obviously, there's no perfect golden era back mm -hmm. where we can look to and say none of this existed. Um, but, um, but I think uh, implied in your presentation and in, and in your book is the idea that uh, things have gotten worse uh, and that the, the level of social abandonment and social isolation has increased. And I'm wondering if maybe you can talk mm -hmm. about sort of this over the course of time how you see that has happened. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, in terms of, you know, I'll talk about the, the safety net first. You know, we've never had, you know, the, a great a great safety net if you compare it to some of the more comprehensive social safety nets that one might see in, in Western Europe. Um, you know, I think there's cons probably consensus uh, among researchers and policymakers that the old aid to families with dependent children or AFDC program, uh, which was replaced uh, with TANF was a great program either. Um, what I see as being different, and actually, you know, something that some of my, uh, some of the women who were a little bit older recognized is that even if it wasn't great, it was there, and there, were, and it was not, you know, as difficult to access as as TANF, so that there. It was known that if you lost a job, there was at least some amount of cash that was going to be available to you. Um, and it was something that you could, again, even if it was relatively paltry amount, was something you, you could count on. You know, women who were a little bit older would talk about, like, you know, there weren't all these hoops to jump through. They wouldn't send you to this program and that program. Um, so in that regard, you know, different different as well. You know, unemployment insurance too, um, you know, is really a program that was designed to help workers, you know, full time, full year workers, you know, who lost jobs that they'd held for a very long time, um, to help them. And as the labor market has changed and as we've seen a proliferation of jobs that are much more intermittent, that have a lot of fluctuating hours and that are not full-time, full year, um, it, it can be difficult depending on where you live and what the circumstances are if you are a low-wage worker to qualify for unemployment insurance. So that's a program that really hasn't sort of kept up with, with changes in, in the labor market. And that, you know, sort of leads me to, to changes in the labor market. Um, you know, there temporary contingent work, 
um, being hired full-time but then only actually working part-time, these are all trends that are sort of accelerated in terms of what we see in, in the labor market. And then layer on top of that the real, you know, almost disappearance of unions, which, again, you know, for women living in a state like Michigan that once once had a strong union presence, you know, is, is pretty significant. So, you know, the fact that employ you know employers are able to sort of set um, set the bounds uh, around which you'll work, you know, is is something that has has changed well. And worker input into you know when they'll work, how much they'll work, and what they'll get paid is really you know all but gone by the wayside. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I can't help but so certainly you emphasize the the level the extra level of social abandonment that exists among uh, the African American uh, community. Um, but I can't help but notice sort of the similarity in some of the language you use mm -hmm. to that among uh, you know all the discussions uh, we have about. Uh, rural whites or poor right. whites and the reason, you know, the, uh, the shift to voting for, for Trump in the last election, uh, the feelings of abandonment, the feelings of being discarded by right. society. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about um, the, the, the relationship between those two sorts of abandonment and maybe the differences? Uh, sure. Um, and that, you know, that's something I've, I've had to think about quite, quite a bit over the sure. last co couple of I months. Imagine. Um, so here's, you know, if I had to do this all over again, I'd have a larger, larger sample and I'd have, you know, I, I would try to have a, a more diverse sample, at least on racial and, and ethnic lines. Yeah, you know, there were a few, a handful of white women who, who did participate in my study. And one thing I think that is, that I saw that was very different, but then, you know, also um, one of my doctoral students at the time who was doing doing work um, around uh, laid off employees saw is that the the social the pers personal safety nets of, of whites were just richer and by that I mean um, this is where you can see sort of the wealth differentials play out so if um, you if a if a white low wage worker loses her job, she's more likely to be part of a family network that can help out in real monetary terms, as opposed to an African American low wage worker who loses her job. Um, the likelihood that her private safety net will be able to help in the same ways is is lower. Um, so even if some of the, I think, experiences of, of abandonment by institutions um, can play out in some of the same ways, the historic legacy of, of wealth inequality and the persistence of, of wealth inequality, I think, matter, matters a lot for, for the actual experiences of, of people. Um, there's more. There's more family help. Um, there's possibly more help in trying to reconnect to jobs. Um, one of the women in my study, Sharon, um, you know, she lost her job. Her unemployment benefits were contested. She didn't have any income coming in for six months. Her parents cashed out part of their retirement savings and loaned her, you know. Sixty thousand dollars to live on for several years. Now, cashing—you know—we might get uh, a little worried about her parents cashing out their retirement, um, but you know, she, but she had that available to her, um, and no one, uh, none of the women, African American women, had anything remotely like that. You know, it was difficult for their family members to even, you know, lend them twenty dollars to to buy groceries, and that's. I guess where I see some of the fundamental differences um, really playing out. So that that makes me think a little bit about um, some of the aspects of this that you didn't mention in your presentation that uh, that um, 
you know, have hit the African American community harder than other communities. Uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, the large degree of incarceration of, of young men in mm -hmm. that community, the um, increase, although this has been true across all demographic groups, mm -hmm. the increase in uh, non-marital childbearing and, and uh, single female, single female headed households. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit I guess yeah. that th those factors are sort of uh, behind what you just said in, in your last response, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about those. Sure. Um, you know, I think as I mentioned in the very beginning of my presentation, you know, the majority of women who I interviewed you know, were single parents, but not always. Um, mm -hmm. A number of them you know, were divorced, and a number of them got married during uh, during the time that, that I was interviewing them. Um, and you know, marriage did not really, marriage did not have the protective factors, you know, that that it, you know, the literature might suggest that it would. Um, you know, the two incomes um, didn't necessarily help, um, and in part, you know, because African American males' unemployment rates are much higher than than comparable. Uh, you know, white men of, of the same education level. You know, and, you know, these were guys who didn't have criminal records, um, you know, guys who had fairly solid work histories, but, you know, who were prone to being laid, laid off quite a bit. Um, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, we can get a, hung up on the family structure argument, but the fact of the matter is, you know, family structures are, are shifting and changing, uh, you know, kind of across racial and, and ethnic lines. And, you know, we can say, well, it's because people, you know, people aren't, aren't married, but that doesn't sort of address the, the, the issue, issue at hand. Um, you know, two, two people who face some of the same structural uh, inequalities, you know, are, are going to still have a, a really difficult time. Uh, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, an, another kind of uh, trend that I, I saw in several of the examples is, is uh, maybe what I would call the subversion of traditional institutions. So, um, so you know, for in terms of education, uh, you know, we once lived in a world that was mostly dominated by traditional uh, institutions of education, higher education, um, and now this uh, the boom in for-profit colleges, um, other forms of education, and sort of as you, you, I think you use the term, segmented off, uh, and have. Um, and I, I think similarly in the in financial institutions, we have you know this rise of predatory lending, uh, uh, other forms of um, financial institutions that are directed primarily at lower income people, mm -hmm. um, and end up to some extent taking both of those forms of institution taking advantage uh, uh, of those populations maybe more than the traditional institutions had. Um, maybe can you talk a little bit about sort of how that segmentation happened and, and um, maybe do you see regulation, you know, government regulation as being uh, a partial answer to addressing some of that? Yeah, I definitely see government regulation as being very key in addressing some of this problem. I mean, I think, you know, in, in terms of what's happened in the financial services sector, you know, a lot of the predatory practices came about precisely because of a whole series of, of deregu deregulation that occurred. Um, you know, some of it is, you know, technological advances that, you know, have allowed it to be a lot easier for financial financial institutions to do some very specific targeting um, of products to specific profiles of, of people. But you know, the sort of high high fee, high interest rate cards are, are something, you know, that, that came about when, when the financial services sector was, 
was deregulated. Um, you know, and there have been some, move, you know, were some moves over the last, you know, eight years or so to try to put more regulation in place, and some, you know, some regulation has been put put back into into place, and the Consumer Fi uh, Financial Protection Bureau, you know, was brought into existence in large part, you know, to help consumers navigate this this new world of, of predatory lending. Um, but, I, you know, I think some of the signals we've seen, you know, the talk about repealing the Dodd-Frank Act, which, you know, put in place, again, some of these regulations, you know, is a little bit, is a little bit troublesome. Um, you know, on the for-profit education side, you know, I, the same sort of thing, you know, the proliferation, you know, it's a business model, right? It's at the end of the day, these are these are uh, businesses that want to make money, um, and you know, found a niche, uh, found found a population that recognize they, you know, that they need a, a a higher education in order to get ahead in the labor market, and did you know very specific recruiting and advertising. Um, you know, at lower income populations, um, you know, off, you know, you can see today there are commercials on, on, on TV about like, you know, our, our institution is the best place to come if you work all day and have a family and you need to stay up all night uh, working on your online degree. Um, you know, and I think it sounds great, um, but, you know, we haven't really figured out yet what are sort of the best practices in online education. Um, but in the meantime, we've got uh, companies that are charging, you know, astronomical prices um, for this kind of, of instruction. Um, and then, you know, and offering degrees that, you know, whose labor market worthiness hasn't really been tested yet. Very good. Um, I, I think I might add on there uh, um, sort of an observation that you know that these institutions are often taking uh, taking advantage of um, sort of people's inability to to properly distinguish between yeah. you know institutions that can provide a, a degree that would be of help to them and ones that can't uh, or or you know financial uh, products that will be uh, will be helpful to them and those that, that won't be. But, right, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, this has all been very interesting. I think we're uh, out of time, uh, um, yeah, but uh, I'm sure we, we could end up talking about this for, for a long time. And uh, I encourage people who are interested to uh, check out Kristen's book uh, and um, and I'm sure she expands on many of, I know she expands on many of uh, these ideas in there. Uh, so thank you very much, Kristen, and thank you to our audience. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know that uh, a video actually of our webinar uh, are now being posted on IRP's YouTube channel. Uh, and the webinar for t from today will be up by this Friday. Uh, we'd also like to invite you to join IRP for our future upcoming webinars. Uh, to enroll for those, you can click on the screen uh, for the next one, which is on April 12th. Uh, that will feature Brian Thede from Penn State University, who will be presenting on the economic situation faced by rural America. And then on Wednesday, April 26th, uh, Shannon Monat, uh, also of Penn State, uh, is going to be discussing uh, trends in mortality from drugs, alcohol, and suicide. So two, uh, two related presentations coming there. Uh, registration info and information about all of our future seminars will be available on the IRP webpage. Uh, so check it out. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and uh, we'll see you next time. So long.